on the layer fracture definition super on the layer humeral fracture then can be definite as the continuity solution of the distal metastasis of the number about B the condylex and the proximal to the pixel length Well, today we're going to talk about superconner fractures of the humerus, and this often strikes fear in most orthopedic surgeons. This is just the part one. This is a pretty extensive um, <clears throat> discussion because this is a pretty complex f injury and has a lot of problems associated. In this first part, we're going to cover the basic concepts, the management of the fractures, and the prevention and management of the complications is going to be covered in part two. Hopefully, if you learn part one, you don't have to worry about part two. Okay, at the end, uh, you'll just be treating someone else's complications. Okay, the instance, at what age do you see superconductor fractures? Uh, I think five to six is the most common. Yeah, that's right. The incidence peaks at about seven years of age. How come? That's when the metaphyseal bone's the weakest there? Well, that is some of it, that, but that, you know, the main reason is that that's the age when they get their maximum ligamentous laxity. And so when a child falls on their extended upper extremity, which ones are predisposed to have superconductor fractures? Um... The ones with hyperextension. Yeah. Which ones are most likely? Kids like this. This is a boy who had a superconductor fracture on the other side. And you see, this is typical at the seven or eight years of age. That's when they reach their maximum ligamentous laxity. Uh, and so that's when it occurs. So if a child falls on their upper extremity, which ones are more likely to, to get distal radius fractures? I guess ones that aren't as ligamentously That's right. Those who kind of lack uh, elbow, full elbow extension. So, the mechanism of injury is what? You see a hyperextension? Yeah, right. So what factors, what other factors contribute? You just mentioned it a while ago. Oh, the weakness of the metaphyseal. That's right. This is metaphyseal bone. And remember, in our previous discussion, we said metaphyseal bone is weaker because it's bone that's remodeling. So it's a very thin cortical structure. And then the other mechanism of injury. Application in your face. And the specific like examination the performing, expecting the deformity. And now on the triangling, I know the deformity. The palpitation soon they painful and don't relax. They limited the mobility radial and the ulnar pulse, capillar fluid, strain and the sensitivity. Hi, welcome to another radiology channel video on the pediatric elbow radiograph. I'm Dr. Jeremy Jones from radiopedia.org and today we're going to be looking at supercondyl fractures. Take a look at these three radiographs and see if you can identify those that have a supracondylar fracture. If you're not already viewing this in high definition, I suggest you do so. You can always pause the video if you need more time. The elbow joint is made up of the humerus, the ulna and the radius. The radial head sits in the radial notch of the ulna and is surrounded by the annular ligaments. It sits adjacent to the capitellum, which is central in the elbow. When the elbow is extended, the olecranon sits within the olecranon fossa. This is the narrowest point of the distal humerus and therefore the weakest point to the pediatric elbow. If we apply force to the capitellum, the supracondylar portion of the distal humerus is the weakest area and therefore the area most likely to fracture. As such, supracondylar fractures are the commonest of the pediatric elbow fractures. They typically occur following a fall onto a hyperextended elbow. As with any fracture, complications include damage to local vessels such as the brachial artery, 
and damage to local nerves, such as the ulnar nerve, which can be damaged in severe displacement. A line drawn down the anterior surface of the humerus should intersect the middle third of the capitellum. Since the capitellum is displaced posteriorly in the vast majority of supracondylar fractures, this is an extremely helpful tool for demonstrating correct alignment at the elbow joint. Let's look back at our cases. In case A, if we draw a line down the anterior surface of the humerus, and then draw in the expected location of the capitellum, we can see that a force applied down the radius has displaced the capitellum posteriorly. In addition, there is an anterior fat pad indicative of an elbow effusion. There is also irregularity of the dorsal cortex that represents the fracture. If we move on to case B, we can draw in our anterior humeral line and the expected location of the capitellum. There is no capitellar displacement. However, there is a large anterior fat pad suggesting an elbow effusion, which has been caused by this longitudinal fracture through the radial neck. Pros and cons. The most and the common complication is the wearing and the light deformity as the result of the fictive consolidation uh, due to power uh, reduction or the loss. This is an audiovisual representation of a study published in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in 2019. The most common elbow fracture seen in children in the supracondylar region of the humerus, which is thin, weak, and vulnerable to such injuries. The majority of these result from a fall onto an outstretched hand. Most of what is known about these fractures comes from data collected from older children and teens. A team of researchers performed a study in order to learn more about the characteristics and treatment of supracondylar humeral fractures in children. They retrospectively reviewed the records of 103 children between the ages of 9 and 23 months and reviewed the type of fracture, mechanism of injury, rate of malunion, and other factors. They found that the average age at the time of fracture was 18 months, and 63% of the children had a type 3 displaced fracture. 73% of the fractures were the result of a fall from household heights. They also found that the ratio of females to males was 2 to 1, which differed from the data collected from older children where fractures were more common in males. On examining the in-cast x-rays, the team found that many casts were poor-fitting and malunions were significantly associated with a poor-fitting cast. When lateral, column-only fixation was used, the malunion rate was an alarming 36%, but when bicolumnar fixation was used, the malunion rate dropped to 11%. The team also found that 5% of cases were suggestive of non-accidental trauma, consistent with child abuse. Treating supracondylar humeral fractures in infantile patients is challenging. Casts must be form-fitting, and surgeons should be aware of the high rate of malunion associated with lateral column-only fixation. You should apply to the well. I think you're all the above of your peaks at the Wyoming Hospital Police Center by the brightest supracondylar fracture and the increase in the volume and the pain the weird setting the moving mean and the pain the digital percussion the halva. Arm is placed up on towels and a target is drawn out over the capitellum. Once fluoroscopy has been used to mark out the trajectory of the pins, they are placed through the skin, aiming to get maximum divergence at the fracture site. The assistant will hold the K-wire and then the surgeon will bring in the wire driver. 
The humerus is usually on an incline due to the towels underneath the humerus, and this needs to be considered when placing the pin trajectory. The pins are passed until such time as they have bicortical purchase. Sometimes they'll pass across the electron on fossa and encounter four cortices. A second pin is then also placed, and again, fluoroscopic confirmation is performed in the anterior posterior as well as the lateral position. Once two pins have been placed, stability can be checked. Once the final position of the pins in the lateral projection has been checked on fluoroscopy, dynamic screening can also occur. In order for this to occur, the elbow is brought out into extension and again a lateral picture is taken. There should be no fracture site motion. Next, the surgeon can grasp the upper humerus as well as the forearm and under live fluoroscopy, assess for fracture stability. If the fracture site is seen to move, a third pin may be required. The vascularity of the limb should be checked at the conclusion of the procedure to ensure that it is perfectly pink and that there is a strong radial pulse present. Conclusion. The current remodated treatment and the foregrating at the tip and the fracture is the surrogate reduction and the P flex tension and the when the current turkey in the plex and the lighter in the three peaks and the lonely comfort sufficient feel like to stably and the able and the possible. Supracondylar fractures of the humerus in children. Supracondylar fractures constitute approximately 50% of all elbow fractures. The supracondylar region is thin and weak and thus it can fracture easily. Fracture types. The fracture can be an extension type fracture as seen on the left or a flexion type fracture as seen on the right. The first type is an extension type fracture. This is the most common type. It occurs due to falling on an outstretched hand. In this type of fracture, the distal fragment displaces posteriorly. Anterior interosseous neuropraxia is the most common nerve palsy occurring with a supracondylar fracture. Injury to the anterior interosseous nerve will lead to weakness of the flexor digitorum profundus muscle to the index finger and the flexor pollicis longus muscle. The patient will not be able to do the OK sign with his hand or bend the tip of his index finger. Radial nerve neuropraxia is the second most common palsy and is evident by weakness in wrist and finger extension. The second type of fracture is a flexion type fracture, which is and occurs due to a flexed elbow. In this type of fracture, the distal fragment is displaced anteriorly and may be accompanied with an ulnar nerve neuropraxia. Injury of the ulnar nerve will lead to loss of sensation along the little finger. Later on, the patient may also develop weakness of the intrinsic hand muscles and clawing. Gartland's classification for supracondylar elbow fractures. A Gartland type 1 fracture is a non-displaced fracture. A type 2 